This is the lesson. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. These are not dark days. These are great days. And we must all thank God that we have been allowed, each of us, to play a part in making these days memorable in the history of our race. Good morning. Good to see all of you here today inside the house. Thanks for being here on the second Sunday of the new year. Happy 2021. It's amazing to think about that, isn't it? I can remember way back thinking 2020 would never get here. Everybody was saying, do 20 in 2020. Now it's 2021. Thanks so much uh, for being here, for staying engaged online. These are different times, aren't they? These are unique moments in our world and in this point in history. I'm, I'm thankful you're here. We're going to start a new series today. I'm, I appreciate Philip. Last week, Philip stepped up to the plate and uh, preached for me. He preached here, and he did a great job, and I appreciate that. He's, uh, he's just a great staff member. Really excited about Brian, our new executive minister. I'm going to get him up here at the end of the service. But what I'm really pumped about, as always for me, is diving into God's Word. We're going to be diving into a series for the counting today, the next five Sundays. It's a series about perseverance. You know, the days after the holidays, January, sometimes we get what's called the post-holiday blues. More suicide happens during this time. Uh, days are, uh, you know, they're getting lighter, as you can see, or longer, longer. Uh, and, but still, there's a lot of darkness, cloudy, gloomy weather, and people get depressed. People get discouraged. And we're going to talk about persevering. How do you get through that? How do you work through that? I don't know about you, but uh, there have been times when I've thought about throwing in the towel, throwing in the towel on, on the, the ministry, on the faith. Uh, I, I can be honest with you. I would be dishonest if I told you I never had any of those moments. There's been times when I've been so discouraged and felt so defeated that I thought, what is this good for? Why am I doing this? And that's, that's the series we're going to be in. It's called Don't Give Up. Say that with me. Don't give up. That might be what you need to tell yourself. That might be what you need to tell your family member or some friend. Don't give up. Don't give up. That's where we are. I love that Winston Churchill audio clip behind that graphic. If you know your history, you know Winston Churchill served in some of the darkest times, uh, right? During the start of World War II, his people were being assaulted by uh, the Nazi Germany regime, and it, people were devastated. I mean, buildings, they were, they were striking at every point in England. And Churchill had to stand up and say, look, these may be dark days, but they're not dark days for us because we're going to turn it around. We're going to be a different people. We're going to do something different. And one of the greatest things we remember him for is that speech right there, never, ever, ever give in. The title of our series is Don't Give Up. And I love that. Maybe you need to hear that. You might be sitting at home and you may need to hear this message, this series. Don't miss it. Study it with us. So where we're going to be is Psalm 73. Psalm 73 is a psalm about perseverance. Will you read it with us? It's only 28 verses. I want you to read it from every version of the Bible you can read it from. I want you to read it every day. I want you to read it every week at the least. I want you to study it with us. I want you to immerse yourself in it, and let's see what God has to say to us from this passage. So Psalm 73 is known as the book of Job in a nutshell. The book of Job in a nutshell. If you're taking notes on your outline, that's uh, on there. This is the book of Job in a nutshell. You remember the book of Job? Job was a godly man, a righteous man. The devil came. He said, let me at him. God said, okay, but you can't touch him. He went after him. He lost family. He lost possessions. He lost so much. Devil came back. He said, let me at him a little more. God said, okay, but you can't kill him. Job was struck with boils, with 
sickness and lots of things happen. Did Job ever throw in the towel? No, he did not. Even though some of his friends told him to, they advised him to, they said, you can't get any worse, must be your fault, must be uh, something you've done, and so you need to throw in the towel and get over it. Job said, I will not do it because I know my Redeemer lives and I know the way I'm living is right. Job is a righteous man. Asaph is the writer of this. This is a psalm of Asaph. If you have a Bible, you'll notice at the heading of that Bible, uh, whether it's electronic on your phone, iPad, or if it's in your hard copy Bible, at the title, at the heading of it, before verse 1, it says, a psalm of Asaph. Say Asaph's name with me, Asaph, Asaph. Ladies, if you're, if you're going to have a son, this would be a great person, great name. I guarantee nobody else will have it. And he's, a, he's one of those characters that uh, you really want to hold people up to. He was a godly man, a godly man. And he wrote not only one, but he wrote 12 Psalms. He wrote Psalm 50. You should see that same heading over Psalm 50. And he wrote Psalms 73 through 83. Now, who was Asaph? Asaph was a descendant of Gershom. And Gershon was a son of Levi. You remember Levi was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. And when they came into the land, there was possession for each one of them, except the Levi's did not get a possession. If you remember your history, your Bible history, the sons of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh, they got a possession each. I'm talking about land, property. They each got a possession, which made 13, except it only made 12 because Levi didn't get a possession in the land. It was the Levitical duty and responsibility to take care of all things temple, all things worship, all things sacrifice. So the Levitical line were the priests, and they were the ones to take care. They were your full-time ministers, your full-time pastors and preachers, and did all things in the temple. Asaph was in this line. Asaph was appointed by King David. David served for 40 years, seven years in Hebron, and 33 years in Jerusalem. And when they, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, when they brought it there, David appointed Asaph, along with a few others, to lead the worship of the Lord in the in the, the tent, the tabernacle at that time, this Solomon built the temple, so it wasn't built yet, but Asaph was in charge of the music and the prayers, really the worship service, around the Ark of the Covenant in those early days. Asaph played the cymbals. Now, you read about Asaph in First Chronicles chapter 6. You read about how David appointed him in First Chronicles chapter 15. We read that he played the cymbals. We read on down in uh, chapter 16 that he was the chief or the leader. He was the main worship leader, and his job was to lead the team to extol, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. That was his job. And if you keep reading on through the Bible, like if you do a word search of Asaph, you'll see that even Asaph's descendants served in the same capacity in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, th this, where David appoints him, is about 1,000 B.C. Where Ezra and Nehemiah lived was about 400 B.C. You're talking... A, a legacy, a lineage of service and faith of five to six hundred years and beyond. That's incredible. Can you imagine that your descendants 500 years from now, it's hard for us to think about that, 500 years from now would be serving the Lord because you're serving the Lord today in 2021. Pretty incredible to think about that, but it's possible. It's possible don't neglect that. Don't, don't uh, underestimate the power of a godly life and your descendants picking up on that and serving in that capacity. Now, when Asaph started this job, he was probably in his 20s, his early 20s, because we know that Asaph served through David's reign of 40 years. Now, he, he didn't, you know, 
David didn't bring the ark immediately, so he might have served 30 years in David's reign when David appointed him, and most all of Solomon's reign. So we're talking about Solomon's reign was 40 years. So that's 70 years of service. He might have been an 80, 90-year-old man, and he was in his 80s probably when he wrote most of the Psalms that he wrote. We know this because when you get into the weeds of the Psalms, you see that there was turmoil in the kingdom, and there was no turmoil when Solomon was king until late in his kingdom. So what I'm trying to say is here's a man who served for many, many decades. He served the Lord closely. He led others. He guided them in their worship. He was a man close to God. He was a man that knew the scripture. He was a man that, that, that knew a prayer. But something happened in his life. Asaph almost threw in the towel. He almost gave up. And he describes that for us in this psalm. Now, I don't know about you, but it's kind of comforting to me to hear that other Christian leaders or other Christians have been discouraged and have been down, but who have made it through. It's possible, now listen to me now, I'm talking to you now, it's possible that you might be in a dark place. They say we're headed into a dark season in our country because of COVID and other things. If it's going to be dark in your life, let me tell you something. Don't give up. Don't give up. Others have made it through darker times. You hear what I'm saying? Others have made it through darker times. And even if these are the darkest of times, our God, our the Word of God tells us we can make it through. You hear me? Are you with me? We're all here at the beginning of this race. We're all here at the beginning. It's not going to be easy. Things are going to get worse before they get better. I'm talking to you now. I'm not talking about Asaph. Things are going to get worse before they get better. That's what the Bible tells us. Tribulation is coming. They're going to get worse before they get better. Hard times are coming. If you live long enough, there's going to be loss in your life. If you live long enough, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be moments of discouragement, moments of defeat, and moments of despair. If you don't have that stuff, you need to count your blessings and sing hallelujah all the way to your grave. And you should do that anyway, whether there's good times or bad times. Are you with me? Asaph's story is a story of comfort. It's a disturbing story. But it's a story of comfort because we know if he made it, we can make it. So if this is where you are, this series is for you. This is a five-part series, okay? The first part of this psalm we're going to cover today. The, the whole first part of it, first 15 verses. And in these first 15 verses, we, we find out how Asaph got to the edge of the pit of despair, we find out how he got there. And then the rest of the verses, we're going to find out how he turned it around. Today, we're going to talk about the first one. And the next four sermons, we're going to talk about the other four. But today is the introduction, how he got there, and his first move. His first move to get out of this. All right? So let's look at verse 1. Psalm 73, verse 1. Asaph writes, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. That's a song we just sang, isn't it? God is good. Steve, had you repeat that? God is good. You say all the time. I say all the time. You say God is good. That is a bedrock foundational truth in our lives, isn't it? For us, it's not just that God is good. We would say Jesus is Lord. Amen? The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12 that you can't say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. We would say God is good and Jesus is Lord. This is what we teach our kids. We teach our kids that verbally. We teach it to them by example. And listen, regardless of the times we're in, whatever's happening in your life, don't ever forget God is good. He's good and he wants good for your life. In all things, God works for what? For good, Romans 8, 28. Not just in the good things, but even in the bad things, even in the dark days, 
In all things and in all times, God works for good. God is good. Say that with me. God is good. That's what Asaph was saying here. He's saying, this is my proclamation. Let me start this psalm, this song out in the right way. Let me let you know where I stand. Let me let you know the truth upon which I'm sitting. God is good. He's good to his people. He's good to those who are pure in heart. God is good. There's not a person in here that could walk away from this place saying, God's not been good to me. None of you could walk out of here saying, God has not been good to me. I don't care what trouble you're in. I don't care what you've done. I don't care, uh, you know, what place you're in spiritually or emotionally or physically or materially or whatever. God has been good to us. We are so blessed to be living right now in America. We are so blessed. Now, I know you might say, well, wait a minute. It's been better. Yes, there are things that have been better. There are th days that have been better, but it's got to get worse before it gets better, better. You understand better, better? Better, better is the good better. It's the all ultimate better. Better, better. And so, God has been good. This is foundational. This is what Asaph grew up believing. He learned it in Sunday school or Sabbath school. He learned up building his life. That's why he was prominent in his 20s. And David said, I want you, young Levite, I want you to lead the worship because you believe I, I don't just hear you saying it, but I can see it in your life. You believe that God is good. God is good. But I want to see what happened to Asaph. In verse 2, he says, but here's how my story turned. In verse 2, he says, but as for me, I was one of God's people. I, I'm pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. What Asaph is saying here is, you know what, you know, I believe God is good. Jesus is Lord, but I almost threw in the towel on it. I almost gave up. I almost fell over into the pit of despair and discouragement so that I walked away from the faith. That's what he's saying here. That's what this psalm is about. I almost, this almost happened to me. Now, why did this happen to him? A man of faith almost gave up, but God turned him around. This may be where you are. You may be a turnaround story. I love that phrase. I didn't even say that in the first service. Are you a turnaround story? Here's my turnaround story. That may be the hashtag coming out of this series. What's your turnaround story? How did God turn you around. How did he do this? There are a lot of Christians, I think, they're headed to discouragement. They're headed to despair. I'm concerned about those who've lost touch with the body of Christ. And, you know, I especially want to talk to those of you listening online. Don't, what, if, you, if you're not back in person, don't lose touch. Don't justify staying out just for the sake of staying out. I'm concerned that you could go nine months and not worship with the body of Christ, not be in the presence, and still keep your faith alive. The body of Christ is so important. It's so important to the worship of Christ. And, and I'm, I'm, I just, I'm just urging you and begging you to, to you're going to have to dig deeper and dive deeper into God's word and into your faith and into prayer in order to keep your faith strong. And that's just, that's just my belief. These are the times in which we live, and it's the days of the COVID, and we've got to deal with it, but we've got to make sure we don't throw in the towel or have a reason to throw in the towel. If we can do without it for nine months, maybe we can do without it for good, and we don't want that to happen, do we? Say no. No, so they can hear it. How did he get here? How did he get to this point? How did he get there? Three, three things happened in his life. First of all, he couldn't make sense of what God was doing in the world. He just couldn't make sense of it. Listen to verses 3 through 12. That's where we find that. Verses 3 through 12. He says, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace, they clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice, with arrogance. They threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, quote, 
How would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like, always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Do you hear what Asaph is saying here? Here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, some of us are trying to live a good life. Some of us are trying to do right. And we're suffering. But there are people who don't care about God. They don't care about morality. They don't care about what's right and wrong. All they care about is themselves and their own agenda and their own personal health and life. That's all they care about. And they seem to be prospering. Why do the righteous suffer while the wicked prosper? Why do the wicked prosper while the righteous suffer? This is Asaph's big question. This was Job's question. I'm a good man. Why am I suffering so much? Maybe your question today. Why is my life so hard? And it's, there's times like these, times like this past week, times like the past several weeks, the past several months, the past several years. In fact, we could go all the way back to the 1950s and we could see the deterioration of morality and goodness in our culture. Are you with me? You agree with me or disagree with me? It's okay to disagree with me, but let's do it after, all right? I mean, if you're as old as I am, well, it's not very old, unless you're a whole lot younger. But look, if, if you've lived a little while, you've seen how things have gone from pretty good to pretty bad. I mean, if you stand up for Christianity, if you stand up for what's right, if you stand up for a Christian biblical worldview today, you will be ostracized. You'll be criticized. You'll be marginalized. They'll call you a fanatic. They'll call you old-fashioned. They'll call you lots of names. It's not mainstream anymore to be a Christian. I remember when it was. I remember when everybody went to church and, and, uh, and you know everybody pretty much agreed that the Bible was true and that this is how you should live. But it's not that way anymore. In the day of mega churches, you know, there are more mega churches today in our country than there have ever been. I got the number here. I didn't share it the first service. Uh, let me see if I can find it. There are, uh, there are bunches and bunches of them. How about that number? There are bunches and bunches of them in our country today. A mega church is a church of 2,000 plus people in our big cities. In the age of a mega church, you would think Things will be getting better and not getting worse. Are they getting better in our culture? No, they're not getting better. They're getting worse. And so we scratch our heads and we say, God, what are you doing today? What in the world is going on? God never said it would be easy to stand for him. He never said it would be easy to stand for what's right. But, but we just scratch our heads and we think, how could this happen in our Christian nation, on a nation founded on Christian principles, how could abortion happen? How could, how could so many things, I'm not even going to list them, and we, we seem to be getting beat down at every turn. Good and morality and biblical gets beat down while immorality and evil gets elevated. It's prospering while the things we're standing for are being beaten down. What's God doing in the world? Can you understand how Asaph felt? This isn't anything new, but it's much deeper than that. Asaph, secondly, he couldn't make sense of what God was doing in his own life. You see, it's getting personal. Look at verse 14. We'll go back to verse 13 in a minute. Verse 13, 14, he says, all day long. What's that next word? Yeah, say it with me. All day long have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. You see, it's getting personal now. Asaph's like, you know, I'm not doing too well myself. I'm not doing too well myself. Remember, he's a righteous man. This psalm is written by a righteous man. He's in the full-time service of the Lord. He's, he's giving guidance and leadership. It's a man who's reading his Bible. He's saying his prayers. He's walking with God. He's doing everything he can. Yet he says, I've been afflicted. 
I have new punishments every single day. Why is God doing this? God, what are you doing in my life? What are you doing? You know, the, the frustration and the discouragement is about to get the best of him. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure that there aren't a lot of people today who are feeling the same thing. But you know, sometimes our frustration with what's going on in the world is really just a cover for the frustration of what's going on in our own life. We might ask, why do the wicked prosper, when really we, we want to ask, why, why am I not prospering? We ask, why do the righteous suffer, but really what we want to ask is, why is there pain in my life? We ask, is there really a God who's in control of everything? But what we really are asking is, God, why is my marriage falling apart? Why is my life in shambles? Why? Asaph couldn't make any sense of what God was doing in the world. He couldn't make any sense of what God was doing in his own life. So that led him to the third choice he had. He couldn't see any point of pursuing a godly life. I mean, seriously, if this is the way it is, why live this life? Why live this way? I mean, if, if, if it's not going to do me any good, if it's not going to change the world, why do this? Why not live it up? Why not go out and do whatever I want to do? Maybe there's no God at all. That's what they said. Does God know anything? Is there really a God? Is he really holding us accountable? Is there going to be a day of account? Are we just going to live? Because if we're just going to live and die and go out of existence, man, I'm going to grab everything I can and go for the gusto, and I don't care how it affects other people. That's the mentality of the atheist and a lot of those who don't believe, he couldn't see any reason. Verse 13 says, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. He had always believed God was good. God was good. But now I'm wondering, is it really worth it? I tell you, this is not just an issue for Asaph. This is an issue for our time. It's been disheartening to me over the past, I don't know, maybe two or three years, and it's, it's been more than that, just over the past two or three years, to see prominent Christian leaders, pastors, throw in the towel on their faith, walk away from the faith because of current issues that they want to read back into the Bible instead of reading the Bible into them. You with me? I don't have to mention them. They're, they're in pastors who've become atheists. You, you can Google this. Just Google pastors who've become atheists. And you can read about currently people walked away from the faith. Maybe it's because of an ideology or maybe it's because of a hot button social issue or maybe it's because of thinking their way out of Christianity. Whatever it is, it could be just the desire for the pleasures of sin for a short time. Whatever it is, they've walked away and it's, it's been discouraging. And for every pastor that does that, there's a hundred more that are saying, well, you know, I can see myself getting right there. I, I, I don't know if what I'm doing is doing any good. I don't know. There have been people in our church, in my ministry, and I've had a long ministry here and very blessed. People in our church who've gone through hard times, they've reached the edge of despair. They've, they've, they've gotten to that point to where they, they were they were so depressed and defeated, and they walked away. They never came back. Well, you talk about a discouraging moment for a pastor is when you build into someone and build into some people, and they go through a hard time. And I'm, let me tell you right now, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have loss you live long enough some of the worst kinds of loss in the first service I, I looked at some folks who'd lost a spouse recently who'd lost a, a child recently you're going to have this happen it's going to happen if we live long enough the question is what are you going to do what are you going to do are you going to just drop over in and say no what's the use I want to tell you, since March 15th of last year, it's, it, there's been times when I've, I've peered over into the edge of the pit of despair, the pit of discouragement. 
You know, we were all wondering, uh, is the church going to survive? Are things going to be okay? Are, we gonna, are they going to kill the church in America? But even before any of that started, our little grandson was lying in a hospital, and we went to bed every night for 21 days thinking he, he's probably not going to make it, and we got to prepare ourselves for this. I don't know if you're a grandparent, but if you are, that, that's, that's, you know, they, they say being a grandparent is one of the best things, but I want to tell you, it's like quadruple the love without the responsibility, which is really the best of both worlds. But it, it's, it's one of the hardest places to be, just peering over into that darkness and knowing you can't do anything about it. Can't do anything about it. And the COVID, you know, with the, with the assassination of the church or the assassination attempt of the church by the devil, by the devil, I, that's why I'm so proud of you and I'm so proud of our church and lots of churches like this. But I want to tell you, I just want, I just want to be honest with you today. I've been where Asaph is and I'm so glad to read the rest of Asaph's psalm. The devil's the master of discouragement. He wants you to throw in the towel. He wanted Asaph to throw in the towel. He wants our leaders to throw in the towel. He wants me to throw in the towel. He wants this. There's the day of evil coming. Ephesians 6, 13 talks about a day of evil. I think we're living in that day right now. It's a day of evil. Paul talked about it. And the future of our faith and legacy of our faith is hanging in the balance. Your life and your decisions... And your faith today will determine, in large part, what's going to happen generations from now. You understand what I'm saying? What happened here? Asaph came shining through. Verse 15 happened. Verse 15, he says, If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. In other words, I was thinking this. This is what's going through my mind. This is what keeps me awake at night. I lay awake at night. And I think about the people who've done me wrong. I think about the people who not doing what I want them to do. And I get angry at them and I get mad at them. And anybody else like that, you, you start remembering something somebody did. And the longer you sleep, the madder you get. You're not going to get any sleep that night. Am I the only one that goes through that stuff? And some of you are the ones I've been getting mad at. I'm kidding about that a little bit. You know, we, I'm going to tell you how the fix for that in just a second. And so we, what, do we, what do we do? I mean, what, what can we do? Listen, he said, if I, had be, if, I had spoke, if I had put that on out there, if I had prophesied about that, if, you know, he was a prof, prophet too, the Bible tells us. If, if I had put that out there, he said, but I, these, these are just things going through my mind. He says, if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. You know what stopped him? He knew Others are counting on me. Others are counting on me. God is counting on me. Do you realize that when you get to the edge of the pit of despair, if you fall in or jump in or concede or give in to it all, we're all watching. We're all watching. And it's going to break our heart to know that you, you, you just fell in. We're going to feel blame to, the, to blame, and we're also going to blame you. And we're going to blame the devil. Young people, listen to me. You go off, you go to college. If you throw in the towel in your faith, we're, we're all going to know about it. And we'll know about it. At some time, at some point, we'll know. And it'll be discouraging. But you know what encourages us? When you hold fast, when you don't give up. When, when you turn it around, what do you got to do to turn it around? That's what this series is about. Here's what Asaph had to do. He had to make a five-point turn. There's five messages in this. I'm just going to tell you in just the next few minutes what this first one is. A five-point turn. You ever been on a road where you had to make a five-point turn? Uh, make a turn where you, you just, you know, some turns you can just swing your car lazily around and just make that turn. Those are easy turns. You ever been on a road where you, you couldn't turn and there's no driveway and the road's getting more and more narrow? We were just in Haiti and we were on a road like that and we're like, okay, what are we going to do here? I said, I got this. I'll make a five-point turn. Now, it might have been a seven or eight-point turn. I can't remember now, but we'll call it a five-point turn. 
You know, it's where you, it's where you go over, you go back, you go over, you go back, and then you pull out. That's a five-point turn. And that's what you got to do sometimes, especially when it comes to discouragement. And when you make a five-point turn, you can't keep rolling. You can't keep moving. The first thing you have to do is you have to stop. You have to stop. Just stop. Sometimes you can keep rolling on a turn, but when, when you get to the edge, you got to stop. There's no way to keep moving. You got to stop. To stop and think about what you're doing. Are you going to put everyone else at risk? Everybody's going over. You would disgrace your God and his people. Sometimes we'd cry out to God for an answer. God, why is this happening? Well, what God wants from us first is he, want a, he wants a commitment. He says, look, I, I'm, I'm going to help you through this, but you've got to stop. You've got to stop. Just stop. Everybody say that. Stop. That's the first step of a five-point turn. You've got to stop. That's what we're going to talk about, the rest of these. You've got to stop feeding your mind with all the negativity in your life. If that means turning off the news, turn it off. I promise you, it'll go on without you. If that means deleting your Facebook account, your Twitter account, your social media accounts, then delete them. Your emotional and spiritual health is more important than you being there. You with me? Delete it. If you need to do it for your kids, do it. If you're paying for their phone, you do it. You can do it. If, if, if there are negative people in your life speaking into your life, stop it. Stop hanging out with them. Stop listening to them. Stop being with them. If they're going to just speak negative into your life, and you tell them. And you need to start reading your Bible and start spending more time in prayer. Just stop the negativity. And secondly, stop only thinking about yourself. That's what Asaph was saying here. He said, I had to remember this, God's people. We're all in this together, and people are watching. And we need to realize that if one falls, in a way, we all fall. We all fall. The cause of Christ is damaged when a prominent Christian leader says, eh, I don't believe this anymore. I've been preaching a lie and living a lie. Can you see how it hurts everybody? Stop focusing only on your pain. Stop thinking everything has to turn out the way you think it has to turn out. If everything has to turn out the way you think it has to turn out, you're going to get discouraged because guess what? It's not going to. Stop thinking that your way is the only right way. Stop thinking that God is not going to, in all things, work together for good, even the bad things. Stop doubting that God is using your daily life to reap a harvest that will last for generations. Stop. That's the first, that's the first decision in a five-point turn to get your life back on track. Just stop. Will you pray with me? Lord, I'm talking to people right now, some of them who are about to throw in the towel, some of them who are about to give up, some of them who are questioning whether or not this is worth it, whether it's all vanity. I'm talking to people, God, who've been there and some who are there, and I'm, I'm talking to them, God, because you want them to know that there's a reason to keep going, that even though things might get worse before they get better, that Jesus is still alive. He's still on the throne. The cross is still effective. The blood still washes our sins away. There's still an opportunity to repent. There's still an opportunity for forgiveness. There's still a way back. Lord, that's what we need to know. We don't, we don't have to suffer this alone, and we aren't alone. Lord, help us not to walk away from our faith or walk away from your people, but to reach out a hand and say, I, I need a little help pull me back. God, I pray you bless this series and bless this passage and bless our study to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.